My dear brothers and sisters, as you are aware, from the 25th of October, together with 21 other pilgrims, we went to Barcelona, then to Lutz, to the Vatican, and to Fatima. It was a time of deep spiritual renewal. And during our time away, we prayed for you and we prayed for our parish community. That God will keep us together and God will bless each and every family in this parish. Amen. Amen. I am sure if this were not the Catholic Church, where readings are chosen ahead of time, and you came to Mass on harvest today, and you had readings like this about giving to God. You say, ah, Father, you chose these readings to make us, we give you money on harvest day. But God in his providence designs everything. And so providentially, we are giving readings that concern giving. Precisely giving to God. The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 10 to 16. You would recall that in 1 Kings 17, verse 1, the prophet himself had ordered that heavens would be closed. There was going to be a time of drought. And that is a background that serves to give this reading some focus. So it was a time of drought, a time of economic uncertainty. Then we have a widow who comes out gathering six because widows at that time didn't have any form of social support. So she had to fend for herself and her son. There comes the prophet asking for a cup of water. And as she goes to get it, the prophet, like the proverbial Oliver Twist, is asking for more. Please bring along a bit of bread. And the widow narrates her own precarious situation. And I thought the prophet would say that, oh, don't worry, I understand. He still made the demand. First, give me something before you give yourself and your son. Then he makes a claim that thus says the Lord, the jar of flour shall not go empty, but the jug of oil run dry until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. My dear brothers and sisters, whenever there is economic uncertainty, the first rule of nature is self-preservation. So this widow had every right, if she were to follow the normal norms, to tell the prophet that, look, go to another place. Because I just mentioned to you that I don't have enough. This widow wasn't a Jew. She was a Gentile. But when she heard the words, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, she could have said, I don't belong to you. So why pay attention to your God? But on hearing those words, she was ready to deny herself and to rely on the promise of the provisions of God. My dear brother, my dear sister, how are we able to rely on God's provisional promises when it comes to giving to him, even in times of economic uncertainties? We are not told how 
that jug of oil didn't run dry or how the flour didn't get finished. We are not told what provisions God made, but we are told that it didn't run dry until. In other words, God has a way of providing the needs of the widow and the son. Just because they believed that that says the God of Israel. Are we able to deny ourselves? And provide for God. Or God's house. Or God's prophets. Because we believe that says the Lord, the God of Israel. Look at the gospel reading. Again, we are told about a widow who goes to the temple and is putting in her offering. If you look at the temple and the fact that many people were there, it is interesting that Jesus takes note of what each person was putting in. And I guess the first question would be if Jesus were to sit by the collection bowls Sunday after Sunday and he's looking at what you are putting in the collection, would he hold you out for an example? But why does he hold out the woman, the widow? Because we are told that she put in all her livelihood. So the kind of giving that this widow gave was a sacrificial giving. And that is why Jesus holds her out for example. That kind of giving which was going to cost her her whole livelihood. But she still believed in the God of provision. That providential God who takes care of even the sparrows. So she was ready to detach herself from what she had so that the temple and its needs would be taken care of. Because she knew she was giving to God. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to giving to God and his temple, Do we always give out of our surplus or we give even when it costs us? As we are coming here this morning, were we already thinking of what we are going to give God on this harvest today? Or you are going to say that, look, I don't have anything. I will leave it to the rich to do it. The widow gave her whole livelihood because she believed in the God of provisions. Let me give one practical pastoral example. Take, for instance, the day-born contributions that we make. From where I sit and what I see, for almost every day born group, you have only one person or two persons who are driving the giving. So you see a large amount and there's one person who came to put it in. It's not even a collective contribution. And is it that we are not able to or because for us, today is harvest day. And God in his providence has given us readings that should help us think of what we give him and how we give him and the heart with which we give him.
Lord. Today we get to hear about a young man who ran to Jesus and asked us about how to inherit eternal life. And that story is also found in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Matthew, he is described as a rich young man. In Luke's Gospel, he is described as a ruler. And that is why sometimes when we hear this story, we hear it in connection with a man who is described as a rich young ruler. But friends, that title, A Rich Young Ruler, helps all of us to identify with this man in a very special way. I mean, think of him as somebody who is young and desiring eternal life. Because sometimes when people are young, they don't think about eternity yet. They think eternity or eternal life, the issues concerning eternal life are for those who are old. But this is a young man who in his youthful days was conscious about remembering his creator and therefore would ask, how do I inherit eternal life? If you think of him as a ruler, somebody in a position of authority, we also know that sometimes when people are in positions of authority and they exercise power, they only think of here and now. They don't think of how they are exercising power in relation to their own salvation. And that is why it's refreshing to see somebody who is a ruler, who exercises power, but is thinking not just of how to exercise that power, but also how to inherit eternal life. If you think of as somebody who is rich, thinking of eternal life, it also brings into focus the idea that even when we are rich, we know that we are accountable to God. And therefore, we shouldn't allow our riches to prevent us from inheriting eternal life. So brothers and sisters, whether he was young, whether he was rich, whether he was a ruler, this young man is asking us all to think about how we also see the importance of reflecting and seeking eternal life. And so this morning, we don't want to reflect and ask ourselves, how often do I think of eternity? Do I see a relationship between what I do and how what I do will help me inherit eternal life? There's one thing we can take up from this man. The issue of eternal life was so important to him that he would run, go and kneel down before Jesus and ask him this question. That desire was so strong that how Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus and would run and go and climb a tree. So it's not just enough to think of eternal life. It is also equally important to reflect on how deeply that desire is ingrained in us. That won't miss any opportunity of being instructed in the ways of eternal life. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And this man would not allow that opportunity to pass him by. So brothers and sisters, how strong is that desire in you of knowing more about eternal life and 
therefore going to Jesus every day to ask him that question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus gives him the commandment. And here the emphasis is on the second table of the commandment. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. If you look at the commandments that Jesus listed, they all border on our relationship with one another and our relationship with our family. And the man will say that, teacher, all of these are reserved for my youth. Doesn't he deserve that kind of blessing? He was conscious that he wouldn't hurt his neighbor. He would maintain good family relationships. He was observing the commandments so well. And we are told Jesus looked at him and asked him. My dear brothers and sisters, can we pass this same test? As a young man now, if he takes them one after the other, can we say that Jesus will look at us and love us because we have been obeying the commandments? So yes, he passed the first test. But we are told Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, but you lack one thing. Go sell what you have and give it to the poor. My dear brothers and sisters, even though we are commending this young man for being conscious of observing the commandments, you would notice that for him, what was important was not about hurting people at all. But when it came to what he could do for people, point, he stayed firm. So he was only thinking of the not of the commandments. But not what the commandment also requires us to do. And that is equally important. Because as a rich man, you would have thought that he would use his possessions to also help people. But when Jesus says, go and sell your possessions, give them to the poor, he stays firm. He's not used to that kind of life. And this is where the second reading comes in so beautifully. That the letter to the Hebrew reminds us that the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even between soul and spirit, joys and marrows, and able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. So the word of God, it came to him at that point, was so sharp. It went through the reflections of his heart, the thoughts of his heart. And this man went away sad. Brothers and sisters, the word of God comes to us every day. Do we allow the word of God to confront who we are? This man did well. He allowed the word of God to confront who he was. He saw his limitations. But unfortunately, he wasn't ready to do what God's word wanted him to do. How do you receive God's word? Friends, we are told that he was a man of great Jesus will say to us that how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Why would this man walk away from it? He had come to hear about how to inherit eternal life. But unfortunately, when he was told what to do, he didn't find himself very wise. It 
was because at this point in his life that allowed material possessions to become the basis of his security and not God. That allowed material possessions to become the basis of his security and not God. And friends, once we do that, Jesus will tell us that our priorities are misplaced. Because wealth is good, riches are important, but for every child of God, the basis of your security must be God and not what you possess. Because after all, what do you have which is going to be given to you by God? And that is why it is always important for us to think about what the first reading is saying. The need for us to pray for boldness. The need for us to pray for boldness. Because Paul the young, the wise man in today's first reading, he says that I prayed and prudence was given me. I pleaded and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to scepter and throne. And deem riches nothing in comparison with her. Because prudence is that virtue which helps us to see things around us correctly and to apply that truthful vision to action. And if we see things around us correctly, as children of God, knowing that our security comes from God, it helps us to translate that vision into how we will act. How we will live the Christian life. It's not surprising that after prudence was given him, he says that yet all things came to me in her company and countless riches at her hands. So we allow prudence to lead us, seeing things rightly and applying that rightful vision to action, to how we act, how we relate with one another. Indeed, God in his goodness, knowing that our security is in him, leads us in the ways of riches and every other thing that we will need. So as we go through this week, let us think of eternity. As we go through this week, let us ensure that our security is in God and not in what we have. As we go through this week, let us allow the word of God to confront us. Let us not walk away sad, but pray for the grace to do what God w- God's word wants us to do. And let us also pray for prudence. 